Well, good evening and a warm welcome to service. Good to see you all. Uh, I think some of the young people are away at a joint event uh, in uh, Alexandra this evening, but I think they might be joining us later on because you're all welcome to stay afterwards for tea and coffee. If you're able to stay, please do. Uh, but if you have to go, we understand. And then the Congregational Committee will meet uh, tomorrow night at 7.45 here in the church. Uh, our midweek Bible study and prayer meeting for all the congregation, it's on Wednesday at 7.45. And then the Old Boys AGM is on Thursday evening at 7.30 in the Dunlop Hall, so an important meeting for the uh, Old Boys uh, on Thursday at 7.30. Uh, then the open air meetings, I think there was a photograph of the uh, people who gathered on, uh, yesterday for the open air, and uh, it's going to continue this Saturday at uh, 2 o'clock, uh, meet at the corner of Crimea Street and the Shankill Road uh, to take part in that. And those open air meetings will take place on each Saturday in May. Uh, the BB camp is next weekend at Dunluce. Uh, there are 24 boys and nine officers going, and they'd appreciate the congregation uh, remembering them in prayer. So do that, please, during the weekend, of course, over the weekend. And then, as uh, announced this morning and, and last week, the General Assembly is meeting in June, and uh, we're invited to send, well, the minister, a representative elder, and, and somebody else under 30, uh, so an under 30 representative, to sit and deliberate so you can... Uh, sit during the sessions and even uh, take part by giving a speech if you, if you like to. Uh, the person must be a communicant member and approved by the session. Uh, so if anyone is interested in uh, attending or would like more information, please speak to me about that. Those, I think, are all the announcements. And we're here to worship God. And in Psalm 95, it says, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. So let's uh, join together to, to praise God's name. We're going to stand and sing part of Psalm 95. Oh, come, let us joyfully sing to the Lord. Turn to God in prayer. Almighty God, our Father, we bow in your presence to praise you because you are a great God, the King above all. In your hands are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to you. The sea is yours because you made it and your hands formed the dry land. 
And so we bow before you, our maker, who helps us and who provides for us every day. And we give thanks to Almighty God for Jesus Christ, your Son, who loved us and who has freed us from our sins by his blood shed on the cross. And we give thanks to you for your Spirit who enables us to repent and to believe the good news. We give thanks to you for the forgiveness of sins through faith in your Son and for the hope of the resurrection and everlasting life in your presence. And so we bow before you, our Savior, and we give thanks to you for your grace and your mercy towards us. But we also bow before you to confess that we are sinners who sin against you continually. We confess that we haven't loved you as we should with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. And so often we have disregarded your word and we've disobeyed your commandments and we've doubted your love and your faithfulness. Instead of walking in your ways, we have so often gone astray. Instead of living to please you, we have so often lived to please ourselves. Instead of serving you cheerfully, we have so often grumbled and complained. Though we are your people and you've called us to be holy, we confess that so often we have been just like our unbelieving neighbors. And so we pray, do not treat us as our sins deserve. Do not repay us according to our iniquity. But will you have mercy on us and will you forgive us our sins for the sake of Christ our Savior who gave up his life as the ransom to pay for our sins? So will you forgive us and will you give to all who trust in your Son the joy of knowing that we have been forgiven and we have peace with you and we have the hope of everlasting life in your presence? And then will you help us day by day to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled and upright and godly lives while we wait for our Savior to come again? Help us more and more to know and to do your will. Help us to bring glory and honor to you by the way we live each day. And we ask it all in our Savior's name. Amen. So having confessed our sins, hear the good news from Romans 8, where it says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And thanks be to God for his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Let's uh, turn to the Bible and uh, Matthew's Gospel. We've uh, reached uh, Matthew 13. We've been uh, going through this on Sunday evenings, just reading it. We're studying it on Wednesday evenings, so come along on Wednesday evenings to uh, hear uh, that study. But uh, this evening we'll read from verse 53 of chapter 13, and we'll read to verse 21 of chapter 14. In the, the previous verses, uh, the Lord has been teaching the people various parables. And so in Matthew 13 and 53, we read this, and this is God's word. When Jesus had finished these parables, he moved on from there. Coming to his own town, he began teaching the people in their synagogue. And they were amazed. Where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers, they asked? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Aren't all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, Only in his hometown and in his own house is a prophet without honor. And he did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard the reports about Jesus, and he said to his attendants, This is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead. That is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Now, Herod had arrested John and bound him and put him in prison because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, for John had been saying to him, It is not lawful for you to have her. Herod wanted to kill John, but he was afraid of the people because they considered him a prophet. On Herod's birthday, the daughter of Herodias danced for them and pleased Herod so much that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she asked. 
Prompted by her mother, she said, Give me here on a platter the head of John the Baptist. The king was distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he ordered that her request be granted and had John beheaded in the prison. His head was brought in on a platter and given to the girl who carried it to her mother. John's disciples came and took his body and buried it. Then they went and told Jesus. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down in the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish. And looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides women and children. Amen, and we thank God for his word to us this evening. Let's uh, turn to God in prayer again, this time with our prayers of intercession. Let's pray. And Heavenly Father, in our prayers of intercession this evening, we pray for the extension of Christ's kingdom throughout the world. Will you send out preachers into all parts of the world to declare the unsearchable riches of Christ to all men and women and boys and girls? Will you open doors of opportunity and enable those who preach the gospel to make the most of the opportunities that come their way? Will you enable them to preach with boldness and with courage and Will you help them to remain faithful and not to tamper with your word or to change it in any way? We pray too that you'll send out your spirit so that with the blessing of Christ and the work of your spirit, the preaching of your word will become effective so that sinners are convinced and converted to faith in Christ and added to your church. We pray that the gospel of Jesus Christ will run rapidly from place to place and that it will be honored with men and women and children believing the message and trusting in Christ. We pray that true churches will be established in every nation, that sinners will be set free from the dominion of the devil, that they will be brought into your church. We pray for godly leaders in your churches and for faithfulness among all of your people. And we pray that the Lord Jesus will rule in the hearts of your people more and more. And we pray that you'll give strength and courage to those believers who are persecuted for their faith. So that they will not give up but will continue to cling to Christ by faith. We pray for the open air meetings on Saturdays in May. We pray for all those who will be speaking asking that you'll help them to testify to the gospel of Jesus Christ, the only Savior of the world. We pray that people will stop and listen, and that you will cause the seed of your word to sink down into their hearts and bear fruit in their lives. We know your word is like a hammer to break the hardest heart, and it's like a fire to melt the hardest heart. We know that the gospel is a power of God for salvation, so use your mighty and powerful word to deliver sinners from their sin and misery and will you give them salvation. We pray too for the BB camp next weekend and we pray that you'll keep the boys and the officers safe and well. We pray that they'll enjoy their time away together. We pray too that you'll help those who will be leading the devotions and that you will enable the boys to believe what they hear and to trust in Christ the Savior. Lord, will you hear us? Will you answer these and all our prayers in such a way 
that you receive all the praise and the glory and the honor. And we ask it in our Savior's name. Amen. Well, before we turn to God's word again, let's uh, stand to sing, Speak, O Lord, as we come to you. So please turn in your Bible with me to uh, Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews 3, and we'll read the whole chapter. And again, this is God's word. Therefore, holy brothers who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus the apostle and high priest whom we confess. He was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. And Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than Moses, just as the builder of a house has greater honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house, testifying to what would be said in the future, 
But Christ is faithful as a son over God's house. And we are his house if we hold on to our courage and the hope of which we boast. So as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the desert where your fathers tested and tried me and for 40 years saw what I did. That is why I was angry with that generation and I said their hearts are always going astray and they have not known my ways. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ if we hold firmly till the end the confidence we had at first. As has just been said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the desert? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest? If not to those who disobeyed. So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Amen. We thank God for his word to us this evening. Let's pray again for a moment. Now may the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. In the opening verse of today's passage, the writer of the letter addresses his readers and instructs them to fix their thoughts on Jesus. That is, consider him, pay attention to him, contemplate him, think about him. Uh, that's what the, the writer wants his readers to do, and it's what all of us should do. Uh, every day we should fix our thoughts on him. Of course, every day there are many things for us to attend to. We have Lots of duties and responsibilities and activities which take up our time and our attention. Uh, every day there are lots of things for us to think about, but uh, we must also make sure that we fix our thoughts on Jesus every day. And uh, every preacher and every sermon should be directing the congregation to fix their thoughts on Jesus. If a preacher uh, preaches without leading the people to Jesus, then the preacher has fallen short of doing what he's supposed to do. And that's what the writer of this letter has been doing, isn't it? Uh, from the very beginning of this letter, he's been teaching us about the Lord Jesus. He began, of course, by focusing on Jesus' divinity. Uh, I said last week uh, that Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, is one person with two natures. Uh, he, the divine nature, uh, which he shares with the Father and the Spirit, and then his human nature, which he took to himself when he entered the world as one of us. Uh, those two natures are distinct, but inseparable. They're inseparable because the two natures are united now and forever in the person of the Son, but they are distinct in that they're not mixed together because the divine nature remains fully divine and the human nature remains fully human and they're not mixed together to form a third thing which is partly divine and partly human. His natures remain distinct though they're inseparably united in the person of the Son. And so he's God and man in one person. And our writer focused on his divinity, first of all, because he opened the letter by telling us that the Son is heir of all things, and all things were made through him, and uh, he's the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation or imprint of God's being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. In other words, he's the repetition of God the Father. The, the Father and the Son are the same since they share the one divine nature. And since he's God the Son, then he's greater than the prophets and he's greater than the angels. So in the past, God spoke through them, but now God has spoken his final and decisive word by his Son. 
And then the writer has fixed our thoughts on the Son's humanity, hasn't he? For a little while, the Son was made lower than the angels when he became one of us. And he became one of us in order to taste death on our behalf. And in order to provide us with purification for our sins as our great high priest. And so the Son has paid for our sins with his life, and he has cleansed us from all our guilt. And therefore, he has made the devil and death ineffective. He's made the devil and death ineffective because the devil used to terrify us with the prospect of death as the penalty for our sins. But Christ died to free us from the penalty we deserve for our sins so that death is no longer the punishment for our sins it's no longer something for us to fear instead death has become for believers the doorway into God's presence and then since the son of God became one of us and because he suffered as one of us and was tempted as one of us then he's able to help us when we suffer and when we're tempted He's able to come to us when we're suffering and when we're going through troubles and trials and when we're tempted to give up. And he's able to provide us with the help we need to keep going. So our writer has helped us to fix our thoughts on Jesus. He's helped us to fix our thoughts on his divinity. He's helped us to fix our thoughts on his humanity. And in verse 1 of chapter 3, he refers to the Lord Jesus as the apostle and high priest whom we confess. And that's an unusual title for the Lord Jesus. Well, we know of him. We know that he's our high priest. But we're not used to calling him our apostle. So in what sense is he our apostle? The writer calls Jesus our apostle because the Greek word for apostle means messenger. One who is sent. A delegate. Uh, the Lord's apostles, uh, Peter and John and Paul and the others, were appointed by the Lord Jesus, and he sent them out into all the world as his official messengers to proclaim all that he said and did, including how he gave up his life to pay for our sins, how he was raised from the dead on the third day. They were sent by Christ to be his messengers. And Jesus, who is God the Son in flesh, was sent into the world by God to be God's messenger. And as we heard in chapter 1, God has spoken his final and decisive word to us by his Son, who is his messenger, his apostle uh, from heaven. And then in chapter 2, the writer taught us that the Son was made lower than the angels and became one of us so that he could be a merciful and faithful high priest in service of God. And he was able to provide purification for our sins as our great high priest. So by calling Jesus apostle and high priest, the writer is referring to what he's already said to us about Jesus in chapter 1 and in chapter 2. And in verses 2 to 6 of chapter 3, he tells us something else about him. He compares and contrasts Jesus with Moses. So look at verse 2 if you've got your Bible open. Jesus was faithful to God who appointed him just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. So he, he compares Jesus and Moses and he tells us that both of them were faithful to God. And, and Moses was faithful to God, wasn't he? He's one of the great heroes of, of the Bible and even people who don't know much about the, the Bible know about Moses. And when we were growing up and when we were hearing Bible stories for the first time, didn't we love to hear about Moses and how when he was only a baby, he was hidden in that basket uh, among the reeds along the river. And then he was brought up in the palace by Pharaoh's daughter. And then when he was an adult, he killed that Egyptian and he had to flee. And then God spoke to Moses from the burning bush and he was told to take off his sandals. And then God sent Moses to Pharaoh. And then after the 10 plagues, Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt through the Red Sea and into the wilderness. And then Moses received the 10 commandments and he smashed the stone tablets when he saw the golden calf which the people had made. 
And on and on the stories go. We, we love to hear them as children. We still love to hear them. And we know that Moses was faithful. The people often complained in the wilderness. But Moses remained faithful. Yes, once he disobeyed God's word when he struck the rock instead of speaking to it. But otherwise he was faithful. And God used to speak to him face to face. He was a faithful servant. In fact, when the writer mentions Moses' faithfulness, he probably has Numbers 12 and verse 7 in mind, where God said of Moses, He is faithful in all my house. And the Lord Jesus was faithful too, because when he was serving God on the earth as one of us, he never did anything wrong, and he obeyed the law of God perfectly, and he carried out his Father's will completely. And when he suffered and was tempted, he remained faithful and obedient. He may have prayed for the cup of God's wrath to pass from him, but when it was time for him to suffer and die, he didn't refuse to do the Father's will. So he was faithful, just as Moses was faithful. So they had that in common. But then the writer contrasts them. He tells us in verse 3 that the Lord Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than Moses. Why was he found worthy of greater honor than Moses? And we'll look at verse 5 where he says that Moses was faithful as a servant in God's house, whereas the Lord Jesus was faithful as a son over God's house. Moses was only a servant, whereas the Lord Jesus is the son so think of a stately home which is filled with servants, something like Downton Abbey on TV. Some servants are more important than other servants. Some servants uh, never leave the kitchen and they're washing dishes all day long, but some servants are upstairs and they're serving the family at dinner. Some servants are in the master's bedroom helping them to dress and they have the master's ear. Some servants are more important than other servants, but all of them, even the most important servant, is still only a servant. And even the most important servant is nothing compared to the master's son who is in the house and he is also over the house. And while Moses was one of the great heroes of the Bible and while he was a faithful servant, he spoke to God face to face, he was still only a servant. Whereas Jesus is the son, the eternal son of God, equal to the father and the spirit and glory and honor. And the writer highlights Jesus' superiority to Moses in another way. He says in verse 5 that Moses was faithful, testifying to what would be said in the future. In other words, Moses' ministry was about the future and about the one who would come after him. So Moses was a faithful servant, but the focus of his ministry was, what on, was on what would happen later in the future when the Son came into the world as God's apostle and high priest and as our Savior. So Jesus and Moses were both faithful, but Jesus is superior to Moses because Moses was a servant, whereas Jesus is the Son. And Moses was to prepare for the coming of the Son. Now, why is our writer telling us this? Why is he contrasting Jesus and Moses? It's because the people who read this letter first were being tempted by what they were suffering to abandon the Christian faith and to go back to the Old Testament religion of the Jews, back to the prophets uh, through whom God used to speak, back to the angels through whom God gave the law, back to Moses, who was God's faithful servant. And the writer is saying to them, but what are you going back to? Yes, God spoke through the prophets, but only in bits and pieces, whereas he has now spoken his final and decisive word by his son, who is far greater than the prophets. And yes, God gave us his law through the angels, but the angels were made to serve and worship the Son who is far greater than the angels. And yes, Moses was faithful, but Moses was only ever a servant, whereas Jesus is God's Son, 
And therefore he's far, far, far greater than Moses. And so don't give up what you've come to believe. That's the point of the second half of verse 6. He's been referring to God's house. Moses was faithful in God's house. Jesus is faithful over God's house. But he's not referring to a, to a physical house made of bricks. He's referring to a spiritual house. He's referring to God's people, God's church. And so he says to his readers, we are his house. We are his house. However, we are his house only if we hold on to our courage and the hope of which we boast. And the word translated courage should perhaps be confidence. And it refers to our confidence in God's promises. And so he's appealing to his readers, he's appealing to us to persevere in the faith. Keep going in the faith. Keep trusting in Christ the Savior. Keep trusting in the promises of God. Don't give up the faith. Don't turn away from Christ. Persevere. Those who persevere are God's house. And before we move on to the next part of today's passage, let me take you back to verse 1 where he refers to our heavenly calling. Do you see that? A heavenly calling is a calling from heaven. In other words, it's a calling from God in heaven. And a heavenly calling is also a calling to heaven. God in heaven is calling us to heaven. He's calling us into his presence in the life to come. He's promising us eternal life in the glory to come where the troubles and trials of this life will be over, where we'll enjoy perfect peace and rest forever. God is calling us into his presence. And the reason he sent his son from heaven to earth was to bring us to God in heaven. And so we've received this heavenly calling, but we need to persevere. We need to hold on to our confidence in God's promises. We need to hold on to our hope. Don't give up the faith, but stand firm in the faith. That's what you're to do, because only those who stand firm in the faith will enter the glory to come, which is what God is calling us to. And that takes me to the second part of today's passage, which is a warning not to fall away. And the writer bases his warning on Psalm 95, which we sang part of it at the beginning. We were able to sing about Meribah and Massa. And uh, look at verse 7 of today's passage where the writer says, So as the Holy Spirit says. And then he quotes from verses uh, 7 to 11 of Psalm 95. And let's just pause for a moment to think about the way he introduces this psalm. As the Holy Spirit says. We don't know who wrote Psalm 95. Many of the psalms were written by David. But we don't know who wrote Psalm 95. That is, we don't know who the human author was. But we know that Psalm 95, like all the other psalms and like the rest of the Bible, was written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, who is a third person of the Trinity. And uh, the Holy Spirit inspired this person and that person to write this psalm and that psalm and this book and that book. And since all of it was written under his inspiration, then all of it is the word of God, which we're to receive and believe and obey because it is the word of God. But notice as well how the writer refers to what the Holy Spirit is doing. He wrote, as the Holy Spirit says. He's using the, the present tense of the, the verb to say. Uh, though the Holy Spirit inspired the psalmist many years before the letter to the Hebrews was written, the Holy Spirit was using that psalm to speak to the people who first heard the book of Hebrews. God, the Holy Spirit, was speaking to them. And he's still speaking to us today. Though the psalm was written long ago, though the letter to the Hebrews was written long ago, the Holy Spirit is still speaking to us today through these words. Whenever God's word is read, God is speaking to us. God comes to us in the reading and preaching of his word. And it's not that he spoke in the past and never again. He speaks to us whenever his word is read. And what is the Holy Spirit saying to us today? He's saying today. 
If you hear God's voice, don't harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness. The psalm is re referring to that time uh, when the Israelites were in the wilderness in the days of Moses. And uh, there was that time, and it's recorded for us in Exodus 17, when the people complained at uh, Meribah and Massa. They complained that there was no water, and they tested the Lord's ability to help them. But God gave them water from the rock. And then later they came to the edge of the promised land. They left Mount Sinai a mere 11 days before. And they could have gone straight into the promised land. But instead of listening to the voice of the Lord, who commanded them to go in and take the land, they listened to the voice of the spies who said it was going to be too hard. And so because they did not listen to God's voice, God was angry with them. And he made an oath that none of that generation, apart from Joshua and Caleb who believed, but none of the rest would enter the promised land. But all of them would die in the wilderness and their children would possess the land. And so they were to wander through the wilderness for 40 long years until all of them had died. They'd all seen God's power because hadn't they seen the ten plagues which the Lord sent on the Egyptians? Hadn't they seen how God opened up a way for them through the Red Sea? Hadn't he given them water from the rock? Hadn't he fed them with manna and quail? Hadn't he helped them defeat enemy armies? They had seen God's power with their own eyes. But they hardened their hearts. And so instead of having a good believing heart, they had a sinful unbelieving heart that's what the psalm was about psalm 95 and the writer applies it to his readers and to us the holy spirit applies it to us uh, when he says in verse 12 that we're to see to it that we don't have a sinful unbelieving heart that turns away from the living god uh, see to it he means uh, take care watch out beware be warned make sure your heart doesn't become hard and unresponsive so that you no longer listen to what God has said to us by his son about our salvation. Make sure your heart does not become hard and unresponsive so that you no longer believe what you once believed. It's a similar message to the one we had this morning, isn't it, from the book of Ruth. Uh, Orpah and Ruth both had a choice to make to, to return to the paganism and death of Moab. Or to go on to Bethlehem and to worship the true and living God. They had a choice to make that day. And we have a choice to make. Every time we hear God's word, will we harden our heart to it? Or will we receive, believe, and obey it? God has spoken his final and decisive word by his son. It's a message about our salvation. But will we believe what he has said? That's a choice we always have to make whenever we hear God's word. It seems the first readers of this book were being tempted to disregard what they had heard from God about Christ and about our salvation they were being tempted to stop believing in him and to return to their old religion. Uh, believing in Christ had become too hard. Uh, they were perhaps being persecuted for their faith. They were perhaps suffering for what they believed. And they were being tempted to give up faith in Jesus Christ and to disregard what they had heard. And uh, it might be the same for you. Uh, being a Christian, it's perhaps becoming hard for you. Maybe it's uh, too hard being a Christian at work. Maybe friends or members of your family don't understand. Maybe it's because believers are scorned so much by the world. Uh, maybe you look at your unbelieving friends and you think things are so much better for them. And perhaps you're tempted to think that you would be better off if you gave up the faith. But uh, what happened to the Israelites who saw God's, per God's power? but who did not believe his word, they fell in the wilderness and they did not see the promised land. And what about you? If you give up the faith, if you stop believing God's word, then the danger is that you will not see the promised land of eternal life. 
And so our writer says, watch out, be warned. He also says we need to encourage one another. Do you see that in verse 13? Encourage one another daily. When I was preaching through uh, to Timothy, we saw that Paul told preachers to preach God's word, correcting, rebuking, and encouraging. And I suggest that we should think about the shepherd with a stick prodding the, the sheep gently to encourage them or to direct them along the right path. So when Hebrews tells us to encourage one another daily, think of a shepherd prodding the sheep gently to encourage them along the right path. That's what we're to do with one another. At home, uh, the members of the same family can encourage one another. Friends can encourage one another. Uh, when we meet together as a church, encourage the people you talk to. Let's help each other to keep going along the right path. And let's uh, help each other so that none of us are hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Sin uh, deceives, doesn't it? Uh, it deceives us by making us think we'd be better off if we listen to the voice of sin instead of listening to the voice of God. Uh, in the Garden of Eden, Eve thought she'd be better off if she took the forbidden fruit. But she was dead wrong, wasn't she? Sin to seize because sin always causes misery and it never ever leaves us better off. And so we should encourage one another so that we're not taken in by sin. And the writer warns us as he did before. So do you remember what he said earlier? Uh, you are God's house, but only if you hold on to your confidence in God's promises. And in verse 14, he says yes, that we have come to share in Christ, but only if we hold firmly till the end the confidence in God's promises, which we had at first. So we need to persevere. We need to stand firm. We, we may have believed in the past, but we need to believe today and the next day, and the next day, and the next, and every next day of our lives. We need to keep believing. We need to cling to Christ continually. And at the end of today's passage, the writer goes back to the example of the, the Israelites to reiterate for us what he's been saying throughout uh, this chapter. So first he quotes uh, Verse 15 of the psalm again. Today, if you hear God's voice, don't harden your hearts as they did in rebellion. And then it's as if he underlines the word hear because he asks the question, who were those who heard and rebelled? Who heard God's voice? And it was the ones Moses led out of Egypt. So they started off well because they were the ones who experienced God's uh, rescue when he rescued them from the Egyptians. But before reaching the promised land, they hardened their hearts to God's word and they would not listen to him or believe his promises. And they turned away from the promised land. They turned away from God to go back to Egypt. Go on in, God said to them. I will give you the land. Listen to me, believe me. I will give you the land. But they would not listen. They didn't believe. And so they sinned against him by not believing and by not obeying his word. And he was angry with them and their bodies fell down dead in the wilderness. He had offered them rest in the promised land of Canaan. I'll give it to you, this Eden-like land flowing with milk and honey where you'll have all that you need and more besides. I'll give it to you. But they stopped believing. And therefore, they did not enter his rest. And the writer's point is this. We have started off well. We've started off well because we've made a profession of faith. We've become members of the church. We've begun to follow Christ who is leading us heavenward. So we've started off well, but we need to watch out. And we need to encourage one another, lest our hearts become hard and we no longer believe what God has said to us by his Son about our salvation. We need to watch out and encourage one another, lest we turn away from the living God and turn back to an unbelieving world instead of pressing on to enter the promised rest in the life to come. And so 
When you hear his voice, when you hear God's voice speaking to you through the scriptures, do not harden your heart, but believe what he has said and trust in Christ, the only savior of the world who promises forgiveness, who promises eternal life to everyone who believes in him and who keeps believing in him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for uh, sending your Son into the world as your uh, final and decisive word about our salvation, as our great high priest who provides the purification for our sins, who has tasted death for everyone, who has made the devil and death ineffective, and who is a faithful high priest. Uh, we thank you, Father, for sending him into the world. We thank you, Lord God, for giving us your word, for speaking to us through your word. And we do pray, Heavenly Father, that when we hear your word, when we hear your voice speaking to us uh, through the Bible, uh, prevent us from hardening our hearts, but give us soft hearts. And we pray that we'd always pay attention to your word, that we'd always believe your promises, that we never, ever let go of Christ our Savior who loved us and who gave up his life for us. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Let's stand to sing, I am trusting you, Lord Jesus. stay for tea and coffee if you're able to. But go forth in the name of the Lord. And this is God's charge. We should believe in the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another just as he commanded us. And the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.